it's Richard from the Siebel Hub. And Alex and I welcome you to this, the first chapter, in the first part of our three-part series all about Siebel Customer Order Management. So this is where it all begins. In this chapter, we aim to give you an overview of the key concepts, the key entities, the key ideas that are hiding behind the term Siebel Customer Order Management. Let's take a look at the agenda. In this first chapter, we'll give you a product overview. We'll describe what is in the module known as Customer Order Management. We'll show you that many parts of customer order management are built according to the principles of service-oriented architecture. We'll also spend some time looking at the key concepts, the key business objects, the key business components, the key ideas, the data model around which is built customer order management. And since within the customer order management model, there is the ability to integrate with other applications, we'll look at the different ways that you can do that. All of the ideas that we will see in this chapter will reappear in later chapters in either this part or the further two parts of this online training program. So let's start at the top. What is Siebel Customer Order Management? Siebel Customer Order Management, or COM, is not one thing. It is a set of Siebel CRM modules, many different things in fact, built to support six key ideas. Number one, the ability to create, manage, deploy products within the Siebel application. Secondly, if administration of products is the technical way to describe making a product available, product catalogs are a more customer friendly way of presenting products. When you want to buy something, you want to buy something by being in a situation where you can easily find what you're looking for. You want to search through a catalog. Within the concept of customer order management, it's not just about orders. Orders represent the confirmation that a customer is actually going to buy something. But in many industries, in many businesses, that is not the first step. The concept of a quote is often associated with the steps that precede the creation of an order. So both of those are key concepts which are included as standard in the Siebel CRM customer order management module. When an end user wants to actually buy one of our products, especially let's take the example of a complex product such as a vehicle, uh, the end user expects to be able to customize certain things. And so whether we be a customer buying a car or whether we be a product designer trying to test whether the car that they're building is actually going to work from a business and from a technical point of view, we need to be able to use what we call Siebel Configurator. The elements of Siebel that allow us to instantiate a product and change the color, change the size, change the wheels, change the dashboard, change the engine, whatever it is, to be able to, to build the product that we want to sell or that we want to buy. As I said earlier, customer order management isn't just about orders. To support order management, we need also to be able to get the right price for the product that we're buying or that we're selling. So included within customer order management is a large number of 
elements such as workflows and administration screens to support the concepts of simple and dynamic pricing, ranging so from a very simple idea that the price is always the same to a price that is extremely flexible and extremely dynamic. Finally, as we said at the outset, the customer order management concept includes the, the, the obvious idea that what we do in Siebel needs to be shared with the wider enterprise. So the APIs and integration capabilities that we talk about in this class will be those that are part of the customer order management module. I said earlier that many components of this family, if you like, are built according to the principles of service-oriented architecture. What do we mean? Well, service-oriented architecture is basically a type of software design that strives to make software components that are reusable, that have interfaces that use a common language or common protocol, so that when we look a little bit deeper at some of the key things that we will talk about in this class, we can see that they reflect those principles, such as some we probably already know. A business service is essentially an encapsulated set of functions or methods, as we would call them. They're clearly, they're well-defined business functions that can be called in many different ways through common series of interfaces. Workflow processes are a great example of reusable components. That's their main reason that they exist, is to enable businesses to reuse elements of them or the complete workflows to implement their business process. Above and beyond those two well-known standard elements, there are some specific components of the Siebel customer order management module that are also mapped to these principles. We'll talk in the second part of this class about signals and variable maps, elements that strive to give us standardized protocols, in the case of variable maps, and standardized communication, in the case, case of single signals, to implement key parts of the customer order management infrastructure. Finally, we spoke about it just a minute ago, since customer order management is clearly built around the idea that you will share some of your customer order management data with other applications, it's no surprise that the application service interfaces, the ASIs, are exposing the business services and the workflows into easily consumable web services standardized ways to communicate with the outside world. Now let's turn our attention to the data model. I'm using the word data model here in the widest sense. I'm not talking about business components, I'm not talking about business object, although everything that you see here is expressed in those terms. I, I really, we just want to talk about the key entities and concepts that make up the logical data model. Each of these you will discover in the different chapters of these classes. A product. Probably don't need to tell you too much about what a product is, but let's go through it for the sake of completeness. It could be a physical object that you purchase. It could be a service that you purchase. It could actually even be uh, a human being who delivers that service. So it's some kind of product typically expressed as part of a line of products. So when I look at the product line called washing machines, I would expect to see a number of washing machine models available for purchase. We can divide products essentially into five different things, although this is just a sort of starting point. Some products are really simple in that they never, ever, ever change. When I buy a book from the bookstore, the book, I don't get to choose what's in the book. Somebody else wrote it. So the content is not customizable. But equally, if the cover of the book is red, I don't get to choose the color either. It's a simple non-customizable 
product which is sold as is as we might say take it or leave it the next stage moving beyond that standardized product is that you have a simple product in the sense that there's nothing really for you to change about the product except one or more attributes let's give a concrete example I want to purchase for my partner or for my sister or for my, for my friend a dress and that dress is red in this particular instance the only attribute I can change the only attribute that I can select is the size of the dress so I can choose small, medium, or large, etc. So in that case, we would express it as it's a simple product in the sense that the dress, the pattern, the design of the dress is fixed. I can't change it. But there's one attribute that I can change, the size. Moving beyond those two simple products, we come to a kind of intermediate stage. We often talk about product bundles. Let's say that for the for some marketing purpose or other, the book and the dress are sold together. It's a bundle of products. Customers might gain time by buying the bundle, or indeed they might be offered a special price because they've bought the bundle of products sold together. Moving beyond those three basic principles, we move into customizable products and promotions and customizable products and promotions can also be part of what we call a product bundle but for the purposes of this slide we're defining them as essentially five different ways to express the notion of a product a customizable product with components there are many industries where this is a given I spoke earlier about purchasing a vehicle but purchasing a computer is another good example when I purchase a computer online, I get to choose uh, what kind of computer it is. Is it a laptop? Is it a desktop? Is it to how much CPU does it have? RAM, disk, keyboard? Each element is customizable. It is expressed within Siebel as one product made up of components and I can customize my product by working with the components and saying I don't want this CPU I want a different CPU and so on and so on and we'll see many examples of this within the class another example from a different industry is when I want to uh, subscribe to a telephone a mobile plan so this is not a physical product this is a service but the service is offered perhaps with a certain amount of data a number of free SMS and I can customize the plan to meet my requirements finally we'll talk about promotions in this class which is another marketing definition of a product where we are creating a promotional situation to coincide with some marketing event that's been created and we want to offer a specific combination of product specific uh, customization for example we will offer the laptop with a certain CPU certain RAM certain disk and certain keyboard so a fixed configuration with you if you will and we'll offer that as a promotion with a promotional price that's just one example of how you would use a promotion to position a specific marketing definition of a product all of these we will see in the different chapters of the class speaking of products now we're talking about the entities and concepts that drive the Siebel customer order management data model and very quickly you're going to come up against the concept of an attribute and a class going back to our examples we specified that we had a dress available in small medium and large etc and we specified that uh, you could buy a laptop with a uh, different sizes of hard disk these characteristics are known as attributes and our job is to define those attributes in Siebel in a way that makes them easy to use and to reuse 
So you can see in the screenshot here that I've created an attribute, perhaps a color or something like that, and I have one, two, three, four values. If you hear somebody talking about what are the, what is the domain, what they're essentially saying is what are the values associated with this class? Sorry, with this attribute. If I go back to the idea of address available in small, medium and large, then I would have an attribute called size and the domain would be a list of values, small, medium and large. Very quickly, when you're building attributes, you come across the concept that maybe the company or the organization you work with has many different products but they all need to leverage your attributes. For example, whether I'm selling a laptop, or whether I'm selling a desktop computer, I still need for the user to decide how much hard disk they want. It may be that the values in my attribute, so let's say 500, megabyte, 500 gigabytes, one terabyte or two terabytes, apply to both laptops and to desktops, at which point it feels that I ought to be able to reuse that attribute in both scenarios, laptop and desktop. And as that model becomes more evolved and you realize there are many different attributes that are going to be used in many different products, we come across the idea of a class a grouping of attributes. The idea of a class is to group together attributes so that then when you decide to create another laptop which follows the same form factor and the same concepts as the previous laptop, instead of redefining the different attributes, you can simply say I'm going to create a new product and it is going to be of the same class, at which point you will inherit the attributes from the class. So we can see that attributes and classes provide us with an abstraction layer. Remember that an abstraction layer is basically a simplification layer. It's something that's put in place to make our lives simpler. So instead of trying to build the same attributes over and over again for different laptops or for distant de different desktops, I can use a class to be able to reuse those attributes. For the purposes of this first slide, we're skipping over a lot of detail. We're not talking about parent-child classes. We're not talking about being able to modify domains, or changing the values, but we're giving you the principles. So the next time someone says, what's a class, what's an attribute, you should be able to answer that question. Very commonly, when it comes to actually selling a product or a service, we have to consider not just whether the person can pay for it, we have to also consider whether what they're buying, are they eligible to buy it? And is it compatible with what they've already bought? Two key concepts. Eligibility talks about whether a customer is eligible to buy something. Perhaps a product is not available in a particular location. So a customer living in that location is not eligible to buy it. Similarly, sometimes there's a problem of compatibility. For example, I have already purchased a particular model of car. Now I want to buy a particular model of roof rack to put on top of the car. The roof rack I've chosen is not compatible with the car that I have. Notice the difference here, that with the compatibility we're talking about products. Is this product compatible with this product? So we often talk about this product excludes this product, or this product requires this product, because it could work both ways. So compatibility is always focused on products, Eligibility focuses essentially on whether the customer is eligible to purchase a product or promotion. These are key concepts that we'll talk about in this class. 
of course, we'll show you how to use the product administration screen to build customizable product definitions, to build complex products that are built essentially as a hierarchy of elements. So you will build a structure to describe, for example, your laptop or your uh, mobile plan. It will be made up of components and each of those components may themselves have subcomponents and may have attributes and behaviors to create a very customizable hierarchy. The customizable product definition isn't just a structure. It's also a whole series of key concepts that you'll see in this class. We may need to design a user interface that makes it easier for the end customer to configure the product. It's not enough just to put everything on one page and say, pick your color, pick your size, pick your shape. We have to present it in a way that is intuitive and leads to more sales. We need to build constraints. There may be further restrictions over and above the concepts of eligibility and compatibility that we just spoke about that constrain what you can do when you decide to buy a particular product. There may be combinations of components that are in, not advisable. There may be certain things that require other certain things. There may be other forms of constraints. Constraints are a specific set of rules that help you describe how to make sure that the product that the customer buys is a product that you can actually fulfill. Within customizable products and their definitions, we will also in this class talk about product properties, attributes we've already spoken about, linked items, resources, script and references, all the different things that go together to make a customizable product definition. In terms of infrastructure, as in what makes all of this work, what makes it possible for a user to go from a, a quote with no line items to a completed quote with a configured product with the correct price, the infrastructure items such as signals and variable maps represent the infrastructure that makes the business processes possible. For example, a signal is used to invoke business logic. It is, for example, designed so that when you click a button, you get the correct price for your quote. A variable map is a decomplexification, an abstraction layer that enables us to quickly move the process, for example, between a quote and an order, or an order and an invoice. They build mapping tools, or rather maps, that enable us to quickly move the process through those different documents. These infrastructure items are covered in part two of this online course. Something that you'll very quickly get to grips with is that the majority of objects you will work with in the administration of products, they are versioned. They are defined in administration screens, and then they are released, which is the, the action of essentially saying that your version is complete, and that version is now ready to be manipulated in quotes and orders and so forth. Products are versionable, rather product definitions are versionable, attributes are versionable, classes are versionable, signals and variable maps also. This is not an exhaustive list, the principle behind it is that not only, of course, is it uh, an improvement to be able to track and manage the different versions of a product, for example, it also means that we are able to compare the versions. We are also able to test the new or updated versions using functionality that we'll talk about in this class so that you can be ready even before a new product is released into the application. Price lists. We'll learn very quickly that uh, the presence of something on a price list is a prerequisite for a whole load of things in Siebel. So if you think of it like this, 
even in the simplest Siebel system, there's going to be at least one price list, and any products that you wish to use in a meaningful way will probably be, will be present on that price list. You'll notice that within the context of a price list, we have simple ideas such as a list price, we'll call that the starting price, promotional prices, volume discount rules, and other forms of adjustment, including attribute adjustments, so that prices change according to the situation. A promotional price might just be a short-term change to the price. Uh, a volume discount, I'm sure you've heard of it before, might be that because you're choosing to buy 10 of the same item, we will apply a discount. That discount could be simple or could be tiered. Attribute adjustment is a slightly more sophisticated form of price adjustment. We could say that, well, if you're buying the dress, uh, the, the large size is slightly more expensive than the small size. So we adjust the price based on the value of an attribute. In any case, the price list and price list item object is a fundamental part of the infrastructure of customer order management because it's going to be associated with quotes and orders to enable us to provide the correct price to the customer. And behind that notion of price list, as you'll discover in the third part of the class, we will have lots of workflows and other objects designed to render the correct price in an efficient way that we can then customize according to our business needs. We spoke about category and catalogs earlier. They are essentially meaningful ways to group products together for display purposes. Meaningful for the end customer. Meaningful for the human being who is going to start the process of either selling or buying one of your products. Category and catalog doesn't have to reflect the technical structure of a product. Just because you have a complex product that has 15 components and 200 attributes, that's not the most intuitive way to present it. It may be that you need to create a catalog and present your products in a more friendly way by grouping them into categories. For example, one category might be laptops, another category might be desktops. It's a simplified way of presenting information to the user that facilitates searching and browsing. Earlier we came across the idea that in customer order management there are typically, from the customer point of view, multiple types of document that are going to be seen. Now these documents may not actually be physical pieces of paper, they could be dematerialized into a PDF or simply an email, but the concept of a quote is an offer. It's not a confirmation that the customer has accepted the offer, it's basically proposing to sell something to the customer at a specific price, associated therefore with a price list, with perhaps modified promotional pricing or adjustments made by the salesperson, and that quote could be presented physically to a customer. For example, when you go to a car showroom and you decide, you say to the salesperson that you want to buy a car, you may be presented with a piece of paper which has a quotation on it. it says, well, if you buy this model with this fitting, with these wheels, with this engine, this is how much I'm going to get, I'm going to offer you the, the car at this price. You could say no, at which point maybe the salesperson will make another offer. So within quotes, you'll hear people talking about which version of the quote is it. So quotes from a functional point of view ex exist in multiple versions. Finally, when you're agreed with the salesperson that you are okay on the price and the configuration, that quote could be converted, could be into an order, confirmed that you're actually going to buy it. To put a little bit of pressure on the person who's buying the car, typically a quote will come with a date, a deadline. We must have an answer. You must agree or disagree. You must accept our quote by the end of this week. Otherwise, we'll make you another quote, and maybe that other quote will be more expensive. So it's important if you're dealing with customer order management at all times, even if you're a technical person, to try and pull back from the technical point of view and imagine what this is like from the end customer point of view. So it helps if you have a good idea of the function of the, the business process that you're trying to model. And in that business process, the order 
is a commitment. It's a, it's an agreement that the customer and you, the if you the salesperson and the customer, we agree on a price, we agree on a product. So an order may indeed be uh, inherited from a quote. We agreed on the quote, therefore the order represents essentially a confirmation of the quote. Depending on the industry that you're in, that order may then be sent to a fulfillment center. For example, the manufacturer of your car, or we have to find your car from stock. Or it could be that we need to provision the services that you purchased. You've purchased a mobile plan that gives you 90 gigabytes of, of data per month. Well, we need to be able to provision that so that when you switch on your telephone, you can actually benefit from that service. And it's often used as a starting point or an integration point to integrate with other systems, whether they be uh, uh, billing and rights management, whether they be uh, the provisioning system, which will actually go and make sure that the telephone of the customer has the ability to use the data. So this is a key integration touch point. In many industries, when you sell something, you sell a physical object. When the customer buys the car, they expect to see sooner or later in the uh, sales office or delivered to their home or wherever delivered to a physical car. And that car is an instance of a purchased product. If I purchased the car whose model name was X9, I expect next week, next month, whenever it's being delivered, to have a physical copy of X9 sitting in front of my house or in front of my office. I want an instance of that purchased product. And in Siebel terminology, that's my car, that's my asset. The asset, obviously, is an instance of a product. I ordered one and I got it. An asset is a very important concept in Siebel because it allows us to track what a customer owns. We now know that somebody's purchased a particular vehicle, the X9. We know its serial number. We know the engine serial number. We know when it was built. We know which factory built it. So that we can keep track of this for so many different reasons. We can, for example, go back to the customer in 12 months time and say, Congratulations, you've had your X9 for 12 months. Now we need to make a service to make sure the car is running okay. Or we need to recall the X9 because we realize there's a manufacturing fault and we need to bring it back to the factory to make a repair. These are just a couple of examples of why businesses need to track assets in many cases. And in a lot of cases, we even track things that you, you might even have forgotten about is that maybe today you have a particular mobile plan, but three years ago you had a different mobile plan. Or today you use a particular model of mobile phone, but three years ago you bought another model of a mobile phone. We track not necessarily what you have now, but also what you had in the past. We build a picture of the customer through tracking of both in active and inactive assets and an asset doesn't have to be a physical product. An asset could also be a service which is provisioned. The infrastructure of Siebel includes a set of workflows and other elements to assist companies in implementing what is often called asset-based ordering, where there is a need to track and manage those assets. It is often used to give you one last example, as a basis for upgrades. Well, you, last year you purchased mobile plan number one. This year, we're going to contact everyone who has that mobile plan and offer them an upgrade. In order to be able to do that, we need to be tracking who has that particular service, who has that particular asset. Earlier we touched on the idea that Siebel Customer Order Management as a set of modules includes the inevitability that Siebel does not exist in a vacuum, that there are other applications in the wider enterprise which need to consume things that Siebel has produced. We looked at how the order document is often a, a touch point for other applications to uh, be made aware of the existence of the order so that certain things can be done. The 
bookshelf includes a list of pre-built inbound and outbound web services specific to the order management modules, which means that not only is it helping us integrate with other applications, but it's also, if necessary, helping us understand the relationship between the different objects in the Siebel customer order management, and even then perhaps to leverage these web services to create inbound or outbound flows to specific customized requirements. As we are talking about Siebel in its current guise, it's also important that we mention briefly the fact that there are pre-built inbound REST APIs for product administration and order management, particularly in the telco field. So look for the additional documentation about Siebel Telco within the REST guide. These REST web services are used and were created for, in fact, the platform that is known as Oracle DX4C, or Digital Experience for Communications Cloud Application. So we've reached the end of the first chapter in this series. We've touched on what customer order management represents from a Siebel perspective. We touched on how elements of this are built to support reusability, well-encapsulated, well-organized communication, well-organized functions and modules that support the notion of service-oriented architecture. We've taken a brief tour of the key concepts, the data model, in the generic sense, of Siebel Customer Order Management. And we've touched on the different capabilities of integration. That wraps up the first chapter, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.